So what else we need to do? Okay, so how's that exploration? So we went through the need analysis cost, uh, topic already and now we are moving into the cost of exploration. We have a good understanding of uh, what the problem is, uh, what are the requirements that we are trying to fulfill and how those requirements can translate into functions. So now we're going into the cost of exploration phase. Um, and the idea is now uh, give a better understanding of how can we build something uh, to, to solve our problem. So we will uh, we'll go through these three topics today, the developing the system requirements, uh, the operation requirement analysis, and the performance requirements formulation. So we're going to start with the developing the system requirements. And in there, the process of NEET analysis, as I mentioned already, is intended to provide a well-documented justification for initiating the development of a new system. So we understand that there's a problem, maybe there's a, a person calling uh, for help in, within your company, or there's a proposal request for fixing something um, within your, your company, so you want to put together a, a proposal to address that problem. So that we have a justification, well, ju well documented the justification for the initiation of the new system. And this process also produces a set of operational requirements, which are the objectives of what the system must achieve. Uh, to describe what the new system must be designed to do. The, the principal objective of the concept of exploration phase, which is what we're discussing now, is to convert the operational oriented view of the system derived in the needs analysis phase into an engineer oriented one. Okay, so now we are going from maybe a qualitative way of describing our system to a more quantifiable or maybe a more technical oriented specification of our system. This conver conversion is necessary to provide an explicit and quantifiable basis for selecting an acceptable functional and physical system concept. So again, need analysis allows us to understand, justify, document what we want to do. We, in the concept exploration, we're trying to quantify and also provide an engineer view of our system. So remember the need analysis, so that's the first um, part of this diagram. We already discussed need analysis, so we are now moving into the concept exploration. And as I mentioned, the, the focus on, in, on the development of performance requirement that accurately state the customer needs. Uh, remember the system modernization status, so we are, we are seeing how this system is being built as we go through the system lifecycle model. So the needs analysis phase was devoted to defining a valid set of operational objectives that will be achieved with the new system. So we demonstrate that there was at least one possible way to, me to meet the projected need. So at least there's a way we can think about a specific configuration that can be uh, real in the sense that it can be built. Uh, and that's what we will be observed at the needs analysis phase. However, in the concept exploration phase, one start with a vision based generally on the both feasible concept. So we start with the information that we obtain in the needs analysis. Uh, the degree of system materializations addressed in this phase has progressed to the next level. So remember at the needs analysis phase, we are, we are at the system level. We didn't go deeper into the hierarchy process. Uh, to the next level, namely the definition of the functions that the system and its subsystem must perform to achieve an operational objectives, and to the visualization of the system component configuration. So, at the needs analysis, we are looking at the system from a general standpoint, like at the system level, not 
thinking about how the subsystems, the components, the subcomponents on the parts uh, are. When we look at the cost of exploration, now we start looking at those details. It's like, okay, this is what I want to achieve. So now I need to put together maybe a subsystem for this area, a subsystem for this area, a subsystem for this area, and so on. So here's the table again. I have shown this before. So this is what I'm referring to. So at the top we have the system engineering life cycle. And here are the hierarchy in terms of the system uh, levels. And when we are in the need analysis, we are focusing on the system level. When we are in the concept exploration, we can go up to the subcomponent level in which we can start visualizing what are those uh, engineered components that are going to be part of our system. So here's where we are right now. Um, in terms of the systems engineering method in the concept exploration, so now we're going to see these four um, steps of the engineering process or the engineering method within the concept exploration phase. Uh, the activities in the concept exploration phase and the interrelationships are the result of the applications of the systems engineering method, which starts with the operational requirement analysis. And these are some of the activities that are part of this uh, part, including the analysis, analyzing the stated uh, operational requirements in terms of their objectives. And we start looking at how can we make them more specific. So restating them or amplifying them to provide specificity, independence, and consistency among different objectives to assure compatibility with the other systems and to provide such other information that might be needed in terms of completeness. Performance requirement formulation or functional definition. Uh, we are translating operational requirements into system and subsystem functions. So this is what the system must do. Like I want a car that is capable of providing renewable or that can be powered using renewable sources. Okay, so now at the subsystem and system level, uh, we're going to be using a, a electrical engines, or are we going to be looking at hybrid engines, and so on. Um, formulating the performance parameters required to meet the stated operational requirements. I want the car to give me these many miles per charge, if we're looking at uh, electrical vehicles or I want the car to give me this many miles per gallon if we are looking at hybrids. Uh, then we move into implementation concept exploration. So we have decided um, what we need to do at this point. So some of the activities include exploring a range of feasible implementation technologies. So we have electric cars, we have electric engine, we have hybrid, we have gas. Um, we have rotary engines, so which one are we going to implement? Uh, which one is feasible in terms of achieving the, the goals of our system? Developing functional descriptions and identifying the associated system component for the most promising cases. So maybe these two are the most promising ones, so electric and hybrid. So, um, so how are they going to function? What else do we need for our car to, to be built? Um, defining a necessary and sufficient set of performance characteristics reflecting the functions essential to meeting the system operational requirements. Um, and now, after the physical definition, we want to validate our design. So design validation, conducting a fairness analysis to define a set of performance requirements that accommodate the full range of discernible concepts um, and validating the conformity of these requirements with the stated operational objectives. And refining the requirements if needs necessary. Uh, the interrelationships among the activities in the above steps in the systems engineering method are depicted here. So this is the summary. We've been using this type of diagram um, several times through our uh, discussion. So here we are going again, um, looking at the concept exploration this time. These are the steps of the systems engineering method. So operational requirements, performance requirements, implementation, cost of exploration, and performance requirement validation. And these are the activities that are happening within the concept exploration 
when we apply the system CG Green method. Now moving forward, uh, looking at the operational requirements analysis. This uh, finger right here is looking at the process of developing requirements. Um, so we start with the requirements and elicitation, and then we look at the requirements analysis. Um, if this complete, if not, if they're complete, then we want to look at the documentation of those requirements and also the validation of them. So requirements validation is an extra step, step that might be needed in order for us to document the requirements. Or if they are not validated, then we have to go back into the process of analyzing them and making sure that we can, uh, those are feasible. Um, the first activities include or involve the creation of a set of requirements, the concept exploration phase, a set of operational needs and requirements has been established already. The, the, this must be translated into a set of system-specific requirements de describing the performance. Okay, so requirement elicitation, elicitation, uh, when analysis are developing operational requirements, they rely heavily on input from users and operators, typically through market service or an interview. So these are the people who are basically in a day-to-day -day fashion working with the, the environment where the system is going to be deployed. Uh, so they are the, the users, they are the, the operators, they are the ones who know the problem because they deal with it every day. Um, so when the analysis, so this is the first step in the, in the process of, of requirement elicitation. When analysis are developing performance requirements, they rely on both the people and studies. Initially, the customer is able to provide the threshold of affordability and levels of performance that are desirable. So this is the money that you have, and also this is the, what the system must accomplish. Um, but subject matter experts can also provide performance parameters as function of technology levels, cost, and manufacturability. So one thing is knowing the budget, knowing the performance that is expected, um, but if you're not familiar 100% of the with the subject that you're addressing through this system, you also can rely on subject expert uh, in terms of telling you, okay, if you're going to build something along these lines, this is where you can get the material, or this is the type of material that you should use, um, this is the amount of space, or this is the type of ventilation that you are going to need if you are going, want to use this technology. Um, so, for example, in, in our new building, um, there's areas that are designed specifically for having these 3D printers. Um, you will see, okay, those machines look like they're not going to, uh, they don't occupy as much space. However, you need to have some specific type of ventilation for the materials to, to leave the building and so on. So, a useful approach to developing requirements of any type is, is to ask the six interrogatives, who, what, where, why, when, and how. Okay, so um, we need to cover these six areas. Okay, so operational requirements focus on the why, defining the objectives and purpose of the system. So why do we need this system? Why are we trying to build something along these lines? The performance requirements focus on the what, defining what the system should do. Okay, so what type of performance must be achieved, for instance. Um, the requirement analysis, the activity starts with the initial set of requirements from the elicitation stage. Individual requirements as well as the set of a whole, as a whole, are analyzed for various attributes and characteristics. Some characteristics are desirable, such as the feasible and verifiable. Other characteristics are not, such as vague or inconsistent. So for each requirement, a set of tests of questions is applied to determine whether the requirement is valid. Okay. So we want to make sure that the requirements that we are stating are, are valid in the sense that they, they can be verified and so on. These tests are specific to the develop, development of the system performance requirements. 
Hertz is a requirement fitable to a user need or operational requirement. It is connected to those operational requirements that we started with. Is a requirement redundant with any other requirement? Is this requirement, if we meet this requirement, are we also meeting other requirements? If that's the case, then there should be there, there can be some type of du duplication with the statement of our requirements. Is the requirement consistent with other requirements? Um, if we meet this requirement, can we also meet the other ones? Or meeting this requirement will basically put a stop on meeting other requirements from, from our group. Uh, so they cannot contradict each other, basically. So we need to state them in a way, or if they're contradicting, there, there has to be uh, a way of fixing that because we're going to end up, if not, if we don't fix those, we're going to end up with an infeasible solution or system. Any questions so far? <coughs> questions. Four, is the requirement unambiguous and not subject to interpretation? So. If you read this, or anybody read the, this requirement, are we all understanding the same thing? If you understand something, or another person understands something else, then that requirement must be written differently. We don't want the requirement to be subject to interpretation. Is the requirement technologically feasible? Or can we somehow, with the technology that we have available, meet this requirement? Is the requirement affordable? So, are you asking me to go to uh, Mars? Do we have enough money to make that happen? Or do we have the technology? Or do we have the uh, facilities that will allow us to, to achieve that goal? Is the requirement verifiable? Meaning that you have a way, maybe through uh, experimentation or by looking at previews or historical data, can you verify that requirement? Somehow. If the answer to any of these questions above is no, then the requirement needs to be revised or possibly omitted. Okay, if there's something that is not, any of your requirements is not, uh, the way that you answer these questions is no for one of the, or more, more than one of your requirements, then you need to look at them detailedly and make sure that you revise them or maybe you need to omit them in, as part of your uh, cost of exploration. In addition, our requirements may need to be revised after performing the test. So if you are not here at the beginning of the lecture, um, I started by talking about um, how modeling and simulation is important. This is the part in which those skills become important because, for instance, if you want to verify some of your requirements and you don't have a system already in place, you can use simulation modeling to represent that system and see if within the environment that you're going to test this system using simulation, those requirements can be achieved or not. So, in addition to individual requirement tests, a collective set of tests is also performed. Usually after the individual test has been performed on each requirement. So now we are not only looking at each requirement independently, we are also looking at them as a group. So this, does the set of requirements cover all the user needs and operational requirements? So remember in the need analysis that's what we define, those operational needs, operational requirements. So, are, is the, this group of requirements that we are defining as, as part of the concept explorations meeting those operational uh, requirements? Is the set of requirements feasible in terms of cost, schedule, and technology? So, maybe you have, let's say, $10,000 to, to build this system, and there's technology that you can use to, to build a system, but when, when you look at the overall cost, maybe one of the requirements will require you to spend $7,000, and another requirement requires you to spend another $5,000.
So if you only have 10,000, then the overall cost of meeting all those requirements is not feasible, even though there's a technology to implement them. So there's where you start looking at trade-off. And if the trade-offs end up meeting your requirements, then you're okay. But if even after making a trade-off, you are not able of satisfying or meeting the feasibility in terms of cost, for instance, then you might need to revise and review your requirements. Um, and the set of requirements be very far as a whole. So when you put together your system, do you have some specific performance measures that you can use to test the overall performance of your requirements? Like, uh, maybe you can focus on these three things to verify your requirements as a whole, cost, schedule, and technology. Both types of tests may need to be uh, iterated before a final set of performance requirements exist. So this is not a one-step thing that you're going to sit down and, and write down them. Um, you have to go through this iterative process. So here, this is what we call the three-hour period of conceptual design. Uh, above, we mentioned that the use of six primitive interrogates or questions in developing requirements. We also discussed that operational requirements focus on why and functional requirements focus on the what. Whereas that the analysis goes to understand the other four primitive um, interrogatives, the answer lies with what we call this uh, conceptual design. So we have this triangle, which which basically describe our system concept, and we have these three areas. Um, the operational requirements uh, focus on the why. Why do we need this? And when we start looking at the functional performance requirements, we can specify what and how much. How much are they going to cost? How much they need to perform specifically? When we look at the operational concept or concept of operations, we want to know how this is going to work and who is going to be doing what. And when we look at the operational context um, scenarios, where and when. Where are these going to be performing and when? What time or during which season and so on. So there are these six um, interrogatives that we discussed can be very helpful in terms of defining your, your concept. Three products are needed to describe the six interrogatives. So a new problem, the operational concept sometimes referred to as the concept of operations, addresses who and how, and a description of the operational context, sometimes referred as scenarios, addresses where and when. So this is where and when, right here. Operational concepts are useful since requirements should avoid prescribing how they should be fulfilled. So the term CONOPS is quite general. The components of the CONOPS usually include these four things. The mission description with success, uh, success criteria, relationship with other systems or entities, information sources and destinations, and other relationships or constraints. The CONOPS should be considered as an addition to the operational requirements. It identifies the general approach, though do not specify or specific implementation is described. The CONOPS satisfies the intended goal of the system. Okay, so operational concepts, CONOPS. So, who remember when I, I have mentioned this word a couple of times in, in class? Um, so, if I say scenario, what, what will be the, the first thing that you think about? And this is a question. So, um, so what is the scenario? If I tell you, okay, tell me a scenario for uh, a system that we can always go back to the same example. So, what will be a scenario for a car performance? Gas mileage is the performance of the of the car. Think about 
like when, when we go to a plague, what is the scenario? You know, I'm talking about like if you go to the theater, for instance, and you're in a plague, what is the scenario? Whatever is behind, yeah, right? So it is the same idea. For a system, the scenario could be like for a car, could be uh, um, winter weather, or it could be summer weather, or it could be anything that is going to interact with the system when you put them into function, it's, it's scenario. And we can have a lot of them, depending on the system that you are designing for. Um, so the car is a very simple scenario, uh, a very simple example. Uh, airplane, like one scenario is the landing scenario. So how, what are the things that you need to consider when the plane is going to land? What are the things that you need to consider for the proper operation of the, of the airplane in the air? Um, what are the interactions with the interfaces of the airport? That could be another scenario. So scenarios are important for you to be able to design your system. You need to account for all the different scenarios that are going to interact with your system to make sure that the system performs well in any of the scenarios that you are going to place it. I mentioned this before. I work for GM during the summer and I talk about the F-150 having they having all these test areas in which they have different scenarios for the truck to perform. So they will take each truck, each new design truck through all these scenarios to and to measure the performance of the truck and make sure that it's uh, performing as expected. Um, and, and there could be, I mean, I mean multiple, uh, like for instance, the beta versions <clears throat> for for cer certain systems, there those are uh, developed as uh, test beds, so you, they can go through multiple scenarios. Like they give it to you to different users and see what are the problems. If there's any problems when you put those into uh, different customers, and they can fix those before they go into sell. So. So when we look at the our system design, we have to think about those. Like this is my system. Where I going to, I, am I going to design something for students? Is Texas State the only scenario? If, if Texas State is my scenario, how is this scenario different from other universities? Um, is there any major difference that we have to account for if we want to implement this in other universities? Um, if you're looking at designing something for healthcare, are we targeting this population? Do we want to use this for any other type of population? Uh, if that's the case, what will be the difference between the scenarios, demographics? How is that different? Is technology a component that is tied to these demographics? If that's the case, then we have to plan for different types of technologies addressing different demographics and so on. So a description of an operational context is the last, last piece of this um, triumphant spirit in defining the system concepts. An operational context description describes the environment within which the system is expected to operate. A specific instantiation of this concept is known as a scenario. Uh, another area that is becoming relevant, like these past days, the fire spreads. Like my wife was telling me, so there have been fires, fires for the last. I don't know, 20, 25 years, more than that probably. Why are we not able to to contain them? And like right now, there's one going on in, in California. What? Why? We have technology. We have the resources. Scenarios. There are there are too many scenarios. There are too many things that can happen in a fire. It's very difficult for you to be able to uh, predict how the fire is going to behave because there's multiple things that can uh, change the behavior of the fire. The weather conditions, how the air is flowing, 
where the fire started, what is what is the terrain conditions, and so on. Um, so if you are going to plan to build something to help in containing fires, you have to account for a lot of scenarios, and 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 so on. So. Um, most of the scenarios include at least five elements, and I'm showing here this is a volcano. That's another thing. How do you know how the volcano, when it's going to erupt, um, how is it going to spread, and so on. Um, very difficult. So if you want to build a system to help people evacuate for something like this, this is very challenging. So what is the mission of the scenarios? Uh, what are the friendly parties? The question of friendly parties and system and relationship among those parties and systems. So who else can be helping you in this process as uh, part of your system? Threat, threat actions and plan, a description of action objectives and threat forces. These threats need to not need to be human. They could be natural, for example, volcano eruption. Environment, a description of the physical environment jamming to the mission of the system and the sequence of events. And this is very interesting when we think about simulation modeling. When you do simulation, this is what you're doing. You're trying to come up with a sequence of events that you're going to put together so your system is going to be interacting with this sequence of events. And then you're going to see what is the performance of your system when it's put in these conditions. So a description of individual events along the timeline. This event description should not specify detailed system implementation. Um, so this figure shows different level of scenarios that may be needed in a system development effort. So scenarios for the subsystem, for the system, for the environment, and maybe global uh, level. And there's a description of each one of them here. Um, analysis of alternatives involve the definition of a range of alternative system approach to the uh, general operational mission and a competitive evaluation of their operational effectiveness. Uh, such analysis define the realistic limits of operational effectiveness for the postulated operational situation and provide the framework for a set of complete, consistent, and realistic operational requirements. Um, guidelines for defining alternative concepts. So now we're going into, okay, this is the formal, this is how I see my system. Maybe now I can, from this test description, I can come up with different alternatives. So if you're designing a vehicle, maybe you're looking at uh, five passengers, four passengers, two passenger vehicle, depending on, on what the, the goal of your system is. So if you want to define alternative concepts, these are guidelines that you can use for doing that. Start with the existing or the predecessor system as a baseline. Partition the system into major subsystems. So if you're looking at the cell phone, maybe you're trying to design a new cell phone, you can partition the cell phone in multiple pieces and say, okay, these are the area. Next day. Postulate the alternative that replace one or more of subsystem detection essential to the mission with an advanced, less costly, or otherwise superior version. So maybe I need to look at these multiple components of my cell phone and say, okay, this camera is not very good. Uh, there's a better technology that we can use to replace that camera, and that will, meet the, that will be uh, improving the overall design of this cell phone. Vary the chosen subsystem or superior version singly, or in combination. Consider modifying architecture see appropriate, and continue until you have a total of four to six meaningful alternatives. So you don't have to come up with six alternatives for your system design, uh, for your project, but I want to see at least two. And following this, doesn't have to be totally different systems, but at least you can tell me, okay, this is my design, and if we change this subsystem and we use this other technology, that will be a different alternative, and these are the benefits 
and uh, these advantages of using that technology. Uh, and then obviously you're going to end up with those two alternatives and uh, to compare with. And you're going to tell me out of this, these two alternatives, this is the, the one that I chose moving forward. Uh, and that could be something as, as, okay, maybe this is giving you a better performance, but in terms of the cost, the cost is this much bigger. So I prefer to stay with this cost uh, instead of going that extra level. Uh, so you follow the idea, right? You, you have this at least two alternatives to compare with. Um, simulation. So this is basically set up, setting up our next uh, topic in the agenda. So as I mentioned, simulation is very important where the analysis of alternatives involve complex systems. You don't want to create something and test the physical thing. Uh, you can rely on simulation most of the time. So you don't have the extra expense and you can do it rather quickly than just creating something physical and implementing it. So the analysis often requires the use of computer simulation that measures the effectiveness of a model of the system concept in dealing with model scenario or the system environment. Uh, provide controls that vary the, by, vary the behavior of the selected system and environmental parameters in order to study the, their effect on the overall system behavior. Um, so the next topic for, for this lecture is the derivation of subsystem functions within the performance requirement formulation. Okay, so we identify the major functions that the system must perform to carry out the prescribed operational actions. So for example, a system is needed to transport passengers to such destinations as they may be, as they may wish along the existing roadways. So we can think about multiple systems that we know of that are capable of doing that. Uh, functional elements, among others, that you will need for such a system. If you think about a car or you need or you think about a train or a bus system, functional elements that you will need are a source of power, a structure to house the passengers, a power transmitting interface with the roadway, and operator activated controls of locomotion and direction. Those are functional elements that you will need for a car, for a train, for a bus. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, express in functional terms or verb, verb object. This must. Uh, this element might be called power vehicle, house passengers, transmit power to roadway, control locomotion, and control direction. Okay, so we are trying to derive, again, we are trying to describe the sub subsystem functions. If we are looking at the system that is used to transport passengers, these are the functional elements. This is kind of guiding you to what the subsystem looks like for this specific case. So in this case, you have uh, two, four, five subsystems. Uh, functional exploration and allocation. The exploration of potential system configurations is performed at both the functional and physical level. So to aid in the process of identifying those system functions responsible for its operational characteristics, we call the functional media that can be classic four basic types. Remember this four? Um, signal, data, material, and energy. Okay, so we talk about those four. <clears throat> Functional exploration allocation. <clears throat> Do we or are these operational objectives that require sensing or communication? If so, this means that signal input processing and output function must be involved. Does the system require information to control its operation? If so, how are data generated, processed, stored, and otherwise used? So the system operation involves structures or machineries to house, <coughs> support or process material. If so, what operational operation contains support, process, or manipulate these materials? <coughs> uh, 
Does the system require energy to activate, move power, or otherwise provide a steady motion or heat? So this allows us to look at the functions, right, that are part of this system and to allocate them as these four areas. Furthermore, furthermore uh, functions can be divided again into three categories, input, transformative, and output. Input functions relate to the process of sensing and inputting signals, data material, and energy into, into the systems. How many of you have taken simulation modeling already? It's a manufacturing class. Okay. So, this is basically what you do. You provide an input, your model is transforming that input, and it's generating an output. That's basically how any system will, will perform. You are providing this input, there's a transformative um, method, and then you generate an output. So when you look at the function itself, that's what we're trying to describe. We want to know what is the input, what is that function that is going to transform the input into the output. So the output function related process of interpreting, displaying, synthesizing, and operating signal data, material, energy out of the system, and the transformative functions relate to the process of transforming the input to the output of the four type of functional media. Of course, for complex systems, the number of transformative functions may be quite large and has successive sequences of transformation. So this is um, trying to represent what we just discussed. So we have this input coming into our system. We have the functions that are, those are the ones that are going to transform this into something else. Um, so we transform the input. We have the signal, data, material, and energy. And then, I'm sorry, this is the transformative. So is each one of them can go to any of this direction or the combination of the two can be transformed in any of the other four. Um, so for instance, we, if we transform the material, we want to know what is the temperature, for instance. So that could be a transformation of the material into a signal or into data. <clears throat> uh, and then we have the output function that are going to use this, all this, to tell us what, what's the performance of our system. In constructing an initial function list, it helps to identify inputs and outputs. This list directly leads to the engineer to a list of input and output functions. The transformative function may be easier to identify when examining them in the light of a system input and output. So if we look at this is my input, this is my output, then we can start defining what's going on in here. Um, this is a very easy example, right? I don't know how many of you are coffee, coffee drinkers, but uh, I know that's uh, becoming more popular. So, acknowledging that this is not a complex system, consider a common coffee maker without any drills. By observation and analysis can identify the necessary inputs. For example, signals, user commands, which are we will simply identify as on off. So we're going to turn on off the, the copy maker. Data, there might be no data. We are looking at these old copy makers. Um, maybe the, the newest ones will have some that type of data. Maybe they have some uh, memory that you can store what type of copy you like. Uh, materials, fresh, fresh coffee grinds, uh, filter and water, energy, electricity, and forces mechanical support. Um, in terms of the output signal status, we simply will say that it's on and off. Materials will be real coffee, use filter, use coffee grinds. Energy, probably the heat generated, and forces at this point, no. Okay, so Knowing the input and the outputs, then we can know what's going on within the, or we can try to um, describe the transformative functions of this uh, 
particular system. So identifying input and outputs assist the analyst in identifying functions. So input functions will directly proceed from the input list. Output functions come from the output list. And the transformative functions will be more difficult to identify since it involves some inductive reasoning. However, we now have a guide to this um, inductive process. We know that we must transform the six input into the five outputs in this particular case. This line of inquiry normally reveals an operational significant functions and permit them to be grouped in relation to specific operational objectives. Further, this grouping naturally tends to bring together the elements of different subsystems, which are the first level building block of the system itself. So in the copy maker example, we can focus on transforming the input materials and signal into output materials and signals. In other words, we can identify functions by answering the question, how do we transform fresh coffee grinds and filter and the anonymous of command into real coffee? A use filter, use coffee grinds, and a status. Keeping the list functions minimal and high level and using verb objective syntax, an example list pertaining to the coffee maker could be the following. Um, we have these input functions. Accept user command. Receive coffee materials. Distribute electricity and distribute weight. Output functions provide status, facilitate removal of materials, dissipate heat. And then the transformative function that will connect these two, heat water, mix hot water with coffee grinds, filter out coffee grinds, and warm brew coffee. Okay, so for something as simple as a coffee maker, we can go through this exercise and we can connect all these areas. Um, you see how we went through describing this and then basically summarize that into very simple actions. This will allow you to make this two connection between these two easily. And that's the, the end of this lecture.